So it's 25 degrees outside. Winter came back last night. degrees in here not bad considering it's not exactly airtight uh yeah it's, it stays cold down here when it's warm outside but when it's cold outside it stays warm down here very nice so this video is uh finishing interior part two uh, framing uh, doing this right here kind of the uh, you know internal perimeter wall perimeter wall from the beam over to yonder uh, doing all my things at the standard uh, uh, wall height kind of you know up to that right there uh, it just keeps it simple you know rather than doing uh, you know these things only go about six more inches so you know rather than doing a top plate to there and then a top plate over you know I can just do full top plates and bottom plates that match you know uh, doing it this way you know that's an eight footer you know going eight well you can kind of see you know it's just a few inches over the mud sill so I get a little firewood and it's easier uh, this the roof, the ceiling is sloped so I can stand them up and put them in place but if this were a flat ceiling I wouldn't be able to pre-assemble so kind of what I was doing was pre-assembling sections you know here's one pre-assembled section uh, there's another pre-assembled section there's a pre-assembled section so I'm just doing like eight footer or whatever the section is you know that's like something uh, you know, two, four, six, six foot, eight or something, you know. Pre-assembling those and then setting them in place. Uh, so I got this groove that goes around the perimeter. Uh, and I do a layer of glue. Still wet. Layer of glue uh, along the perimeter, and then a few dabs, a lot of dabs on the side of it. And then I set some of this foam. So, low salves, a similar material to this, but thicker. You know, but this is close enough. You know, low cells there's in four inch and six inch for two by four and two by six walls. I use this under the mud sill, which is eight inch, well, seven and a quarter. So I got this. This is 12 inches wide, you know, and cut out the eight. So I got this remaining four inches. Uh, a couple of those rolls, you know, just using that scrap four inch scrap going around. I uh, saw so some glue and then the foam and then putting these in uh, wedging them in there So they're free, you know, they're loose on the bottom, but not really so in order to get scooted out uh, They got to lift up, you know, like Whenever a rectangle rotates, you know, it creates an arc which is you know uh, further out than the actual thing, you know. And so I'd have to lift up to get out. You know, I could do some minor shifting, but not too much. And when the tile's in there, you know, that'll probably wedge it in there even better. But, I mean, they're not going anywhere. These things, they're wedged in there. You know, you'd have to use the sledge to move them. And I'm not going to use the sledge to move them. Uh, basically, I could do like a, I got a ram set somewheres. 
But I don't got any of the cartridges for it. You know, I got maybe a couple cartridges and nails. They're like a 22 caliber concrete nailer. Uh, Lowe's doesn't sell Ramset or Ramset materials. They sell a different brand, you know, and I really don't want to get a, another concrete nailer, you know. And then it's, you know, it's real loud. It's a 22, so it's kind of like firing it off in a basement. You know, it's shooting a 22 in a basement, you know, so it gets the ring and then the ears going. So it's not pleasant to use, and I would have to get a whole new set of things, you know, I don't, I don't want two concrete nailers. When, and I really don't want to be putting nails, concrete nails, in my concrete, you know, like, first of all, I could chip this mortar that I've floated, uh, second of all, you know, you know, it could weaken the slab, it wouldn't, but it's just kind of just a thing. Why waste time, money, and hearing on something that isn't necessary, you know, and it could potentially cause damage, you know, not just to my hearing, but to the actual structure. Anyways, so that's kind of the reason for that. Uh, these are, you know, this is kind of non-structural framing. You know, you got two standards, 16 and 14 inch, or 16 and 24 inch spacings. These are 24 inch spacings. This is good for like a shack, you know, something you're not living in, or something that's not structural, you know, like you're finishing a basement, which this pretty much is, you know, finish, this is basically a basement, you know. Uh, like if this were structural, this would be, you know, different framings. Uh, this particular one would be either three solids. Well, and then this is, my style of framing is, you know, probably prior year 2000 you know they have updated things codes you know so this might be the new standard they've updated you know you'd have a solid stud pack in your corners and i know with the new style of framing they they look down on that because it's a big chunk of wood right there then in your corners you know you can't insulate it's more about insulating and moisture control these days than you know structural support you know but you know before if we're a corner, you know, it would be three solid studs. Or in a situation like this where it's interior and not bearing, you know, keep in mind that the cinder block is the bearing support, you know, cinder block and beam are the bearing things. These aren't. Uh, so being non bearing, it would be blocks, kind of like this, you know. But then it's just a hassle and not needed. I'll be doing a, this right here is set off this back wall a couple inches. This is uh, the freezer, eight foot. Uh, and then this will be a partition wall right here going out. So it'll be this. This would be a wall uh, end of the freezer. So the freezer is like six foot, I don't know, three or something. Six foot three by eight foot. And then here is the panicrum. It's four foot by whatever, you know, six foot three, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and kind of this right here will be going over, you know, to right here. And then continue over the door then jog back to here and then over so I guess you know these uh, beams are good for supporting a roof but they may be you know not quite enough for supporting you know so many tons of dirt and gravel once this becomes a green roof so you can kind of see here you know it's getting the beams get built out, you know, so this one is being built out on this side plane, so instead of being a 4x4, four four, it's, you know, a 4x2, four you know, two, four, kind of, you know, you might call it a 4x8, you know, but more like a 4x7, you know. This one, we'll get a thing here. stud here where it's going out jogging this way and then a stud here where it's jogging out that way so it's kind of 
you know, like a, a six by six, this one turns into, you know, pretty much. Once those are on there, this one gets turned into a, uh, you know, one like here and one right here uh, for this little partition wall for the uh, concrete bar counter will be over there for the wood cook stove and then this will be a little you know, just a little partition wall where the other stove will be, propane stove and that will be kind of the same thing you know so for simplification 4x8 four 4x8 four Six by six, four by eight is kind of what they'll more or less turn into. Uh, so I mean, at that point, they're plenty strong, you know. Like uh, for being a green roof, I would think, you know. Uh, this is set out to do elbows, so I can do elbow. You know, my water line going up into the thing, drill some holes, and bring it to wherever, you know. Uh, same with the electrical, you know. So I got room to do my 90s. The rest of this will just get installation. Uh, unfaced installation, you know. Uh, don't want anything back there. The insulation will have its face on this side, right here. This outside edge, you know. And then all this won't, you know. Uh. 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 Yeah, so, uh, preassemble the partitions. Uh, so instead of like this, and then a block, and then this, I just do an L, you know, and that's kind of a more like shack framing. Uh, same thing here. Kind of the thing is, you always want something to screw to, you know, like, this is just such a small area, it doesn't really matter. There's not going to be too much flapping going on. I could do like a piece for the store, going over, whatever, you know, and then a piece like this, you know. Uh, that'll get insulations back in there. That kind of insulations, the R30s. Pulling the facing and shoving it in there. In these back cavities, and then uh, doing some 24 inch R13 in the bays. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, so since I could stand them, I could frame it at the bottom. Uh, frame them on the ground. Use the screws. Yeah, it's just, I got a nail gun and a compressor, but it's just, I might as well use screws. Uh, I've been using screws, and might as well just keep using screws. They're a lot quieter. You know, a nail gun might sound like an actual gun, you know, and draw too much attention, you know, so screw gun is uh, quieter and less you know, it's not gonna, no one's gonna call, you know, the police saying that there's someone doing a ton of shooting, you know, when I'm using my screw gun. Uh, pressure treated on the bottom, and the rest is just regular. Uh, yeah, and that'll be the, this video. Uh, I'm gonna give this a little bit of glue. So I got more glue over there. Oh, here we go. I'm gonna do it some little dabs up here, kind of act as spacers. So one of the things for this is that's gonna hold the wall up, the concrete wall. Is uh. Do bracings, you know, this will also help brace this concrete wall, keep it from sliding in. Uh, it also keeps these rafters from falling down, you know, in order to fall down, they got to push this way. So the rafters are screwed. You know, these go flat. 
Uh, so I get a good, uh, a good uh, screw screw point, you know. If I can screw those. So in order for these rafters to go down, that's kind of kicking out the bottom, you know. Uh, this just keeps the bottom from kicking out, you know. First of all, they got little metal brackets, but those are just little metal brackets. Now it's kind of tied into something more substantial. So, you know, in order for it to scoot out, it has to move this wall, this wall through the concrete, you know, which would be braced by the stones and stuff on the outside, the dirt. Uh, and this right here, you can do some wedges and some glues up here. And maybe right in, like, right around in here, here in the middle, uh, is to keep that wood and stone from moving this way, you know, so in order for the block to the concrete wall to you know, bow in, I would have to push this wall, which would have to push these rafters up, you know, so it's kind of just re-bracing the wall. So I'm gonna go out and do those shims, you know, uh, shims and glue. And, uh, Move the plywood over, move that stuff over, continue around a little, uh, maybe. You know, uh, I want to get this tub in sooner rather than later, which is basically doing this exterior wall <coughs> around to over yonder, doing up my little, you know, vanity corner area and tub thing, you know. So I can start showering in here. Uh, nor you know, it's been real nice weather. A lot of 60 degree weather, you know, coming off of a spell of 60 degrees during the day and at night, you know, just unchanging temperature day and night, just kind of constant, right around 60, which was just trippy, you know, that constant right around 60 degrees and 100 humidity, you know, 70 now. Yeah, so that's uh, this one, doing this, you know, and maybe go doing some more. Welcome to Today's Issues, offering a Christian response to the issues of the day. Here's your host, Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Wednesday edition of Today's Issues on the American Family Radio Network. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Walker Wildman in with me. Good morning, Walker. Good morning. Good to be on the show. And Fred Jackson, News Director for AFR. Made it in through the snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last night, uh, late yesterday afternoon, I guess, we started, uh, it started snowing here in uh, Tupelo, and... Uh, I don't know, I guess it lasted for an hour, and uh, we barely made it into work this morning. <laughs> we had uh, probably a good quarter of an inch. Yeah, it was there for about an hour or two. It was pretty heavy. It wasn't yeah. sticking because the ground was too warm. Yeah. Yes. But Fred made it in, I see. Ma made it in. Yeah. No, the, the, seriously, the, the big challenge was getting into your vehicle this morning. Yeah. Iced over. Yeah. yeah, your vehicle was outside last night. Yeah, I so just, uh, that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, the people north of the Mason Dixon are, are going. Say, you know, why are you wasting my time with this? Yeah. Well, they're used to it. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a snow hit across. Uh, I guess it's going up to the east eastern seaboard now. It is. Yeah, it is. It, it's unusual for us to have it this early. I mean, it's not officially winter yet, mm -hmm. but to get that kind of storm, it was. But the kids love it, you know. They do. I don't. Yeah. I don't like winter at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, I don't, you, you like the deer hunt. That's yeah. why you like it. Yeah. All right, Fred. Uh, we, but well, before we, Fred jumps into the news, Walker, what can folks do to well, join us on the show? Sure. A couple different ways. You can always visit our website, AFR.net. All the information about today's issues is on our website, AFR.net. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. Just type in Today's Issues. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube. Lastly, always you can download the free app 
the free American Family Radio app. Okay, big day on, in Washington, D.C., right, Fred? Another big day in Washington, D.C., yes. Uh, today, uh, in the spotlight, is the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee. Senate Judiciary Committee. That is under the chairmanship of Senator Lindsey Graham. Now, what uh, what's going on there today, uh, you will remember just uh, in the last couple of days, we had the release of the Inspector General's report, Michael Horowitz, released his report on what led up to the so-called Russia investigation, Russia collusion investigation, the FBI's involvement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Michael Horowitz is appearing before this committee today. Now, you will remember, as we reported yesterday, Michael Horowitz, in his report uh, that he put out, over 400 pages long, he said he could find no evidence of bias against President Trump, against candidate Trump, in the FBI. Now, he did say they made some mistakes, FBI, but he could find no evidence of bias. Well, Senator Graham kind of put that to rest this morning on a couple of fronts. Now, first, what I want you to do, I want to do is play a, uh, this will be cut number 14, Brent, Senator Graham started to read the emails between P FBI agent Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, boyfriend, girlfriend, and what they were saying about President Trump. This is in the months leading up to the election and even after. So we're going to play you cut number 14. Strzok, the frontline supervisor, February the 12th, 2016. Oh, he's Trump abysmal. I keep hoping the charade will end and people will just dump him. March 3rd, 2016. Page, Trump is a loathsome human. Struck, he's an idiot. July 16th, we're getting closer to when this thing opens. And wow, Donald Trump is an enormous <laughs> Trump barely spoke, but the first thing out of his mouth was we're going to win so big. The whole thing is like living in a bad dream. There you have it. That was just a little excerpt. But then, then Senator Graham goes on to talk about the involvement of FBI lawyer, his last name is Kleinschmidt. He was the FBI lawyer in charge of putting the warrants together for the FISA court. Now, here's what we learned, and Senator Graham really focused in on this. You will remember that the FBI launches this investigation into alleged Russia collusion. One of those that, the, remember the reports, Carter Page, one of the Trump Associates campaign member, Carter Page, he was accused of talking to Russian agents, all right? Now, it's been, now, now there were three, they said there were three Russian agents find out that he never talked to two of them. But he did talk to one of the Russian agents, Carter Page. Mm -hmm. But here's what the American public doesn't know. Carter Page was working for the CIA. He was working for the United States government right. in talking to this Russian agent. The CIA confirmed that Carter Page, in a letter to this Kleinschmidt, this FBI lawyer, before he went to the FISA court. The CIA confirmed to Kleinschmidt that Carter Page was working for us, the U.S. government. Right. Kleinschmidt gets this correspondence, but he doesn't mention that in the warrant to the, to the FISA court. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mention that Carter Page was working for the CIA. Right. So Kleinschmidt puts together the application of the FISA court, not mentioning, all he mentions is that Carter Page is talking to a Russian agent. He doesn't mention what he knows, that Carter Page was working for the CIA. Right, which, which is, a, which is a, a, an omission. It's a, it's a key omission that wasn't by accident. That's right. You had to intentionally withhold that key evidence when you're applying for the FISA warrant 
And the reason, the only reason I can think of that he, that the FBI lawyers withheld this in the FISA warrant application so that they could surveil Carter Page is because it would completely undermine the entire uh, search warrant. Because if you include in the search warrant that the person you're trying to surveil already works for the U.S. government, then why would you need to surveil them? Because they're already a trusted asset. That's right. But this was a way into the Trump campaign. It all began with Carter Page. Without Carter Page, you have no Russia hoax. So they knew in order to get to Carter Page, they had to twist the evidence to fit their narrative. So let me understand you guys correctly. Big picture here. You're telling me that the FBI top lawyer in the James Comey administration intentionally misled a federal uh, judge in order to be able to have that federal judge grant spying um, surveillance, whatever you want to call it, uh, op- uh, on to make that possible to, to spy on the Trump campaign. Yes. yes, that's right. That's what you're telling me. Yes, and the way that that, th- that is that is evidence that is uh, clear evidence. Yeah, and the way we know There's this is not only what Fred's talking about about that uh, not mentioning that. Carter Page works for the U.S. government, but also there's there's 17 other or now 16 other key facts that were that were intentionally withheld from the application. All of those facts would prove that there's no need for an application, that there's no probable cause. And so you add if you do one or two, maybe it was an accident. 17 key facts withheld from the FISA court. That seems that seems criminal to me. It should be. Now, Horowitz, the fellow in front of the Senate Inspector committee General. today, the mm-hmm. Inspector General, he doesn't have the authority to... Um, no, he doesn't do have mean? the prosecutorial authority. Right, right. Yes. But now the other fellow... John Durham. Dur- Durham does. That's correct. Yes. Who, who is hired by William Barr yes. to do his own investigation into how this whole Russia hoax thing started. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well... You know, the, the first take from the Horowitz report the other day, the Inspector General, was that there was no political bias within the FBI against Donald Trump. Lindsey Graham is just shredding that argument. Yes, uh, yeah. completely. And, and when he's reading these texts that you just played a clip from a few minutes ago, it's clear the guy who, who said uh, he's an idiot. Uh, the, Peter Strzok. Lindsey Graham was, Lindsey Graham was quoting. Yes, just for people who haven't followed this very closely, was Peter Strzok. Yes. Peter Strzok was the lead investigator yes. against President Trump in the Russia yes. um, situ- uh, Russia investigation mm-hmm. before Mueller came on the scene. Mm-hmm. And then he was also the one, uh, Strzok, who was the Hillary fanboy yes. who let her off mm-hmm. of the email um, scandal. Yes. Uh, didn't, didn't indict and James Comey. They said, they said, they, they said Hillary Clinton, you know, committed criminal uh, acts, but that we're not going to charge her. No. But they didn't use that word criminal acts. But they basically explained what yes. were criminal acts. You, you anyway, yeah. a lot of people are familiar with all this, but the point is today, Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, is doing an outstanding job mm-hmm. uh, in his laying this all out for the American people. To see. Yeah. Well, the other there's a couple other aspects here. Uh, Lindsey Graham may also made the point this morning uh, that they never informed candidate Trump about they were investigating some of his people. If they were concerned, were they the supposed Trump, to have? Yeah, they were supposed to have. Okay. Graham mentioned this morning that Diane Feinstein, at one point, there was somebody working in her office that might have had some connections to Russia or whatever. China. China. Now, one, China spy. Chi- China spy. First thing they did was inform her, hey, by the way, we're investigating somebody in your office. You okay. need to be aware of that. Okay. Lindsey Graham says, nobody mentioned that to Donald Trump. Why wouldn't you mention to Canada Trump, hey, you may have some people on your staff? Right. But they never told him. Right. right. And they're supposed to. And they're supposed to. If they're following precedent, how they treat no. other people. No, Listen, they, they were out to get him. Is there any wonder why, when the Horowitz report came out in the last couple of days, John Durham, the prosecutor, said, I disagree right. with Mr. Horowitz right. on his assessment there was no bias. 
Is it any wonder that the Attorney General of the United States, William Barr, says, uh-uh, I know <laughs> Mr. Horowitz doesn't have the true story here. In fact, yesterday, Attorney General Barr was doing interviews, Wall Street Journal, NBC, and he was out there talking frankly about what the FBI knew about this dossier problem. This is going to be cut number four, Brent, cut number four. They withheld from the court all the exculpatory information, and they withheld from the court information about the lack of reliability of steel. The real interesting thing here, and to me the major takeaway, actually is after the election. Because in January, they went to, Steele was dealing with one person, I'm talking about one person, and that's the, what we call the primary subsource, and it was that person who had the so-called network of subsources. When they finally got around to talking to him, uh, he said, I don't know what Steele's talking about. I didn't tell him this stuff. Or, you know, it was mostly barroom talk and, and rumor. I made it clear to him this was my own suppositions and theories. And, you know, this is, and, and at that point, it was clear that the dossier was a sham. So what happens? What happens at that point? They don't tell the court, and they continue to get FISA warrants based on that dossier. And that they actually filed with the court a statement saying, we talked to the subsource, and we found him credible and cooperative. And they put that in to bolster. When the subsource had, had, had actually, had when actually the, what, said. When he, they, what he was being truthful about is that the dossier was garbage. <laughs> wow. That was William Barr, the Attorney General. General. Yeah. That's you, the most I've heard from any yeah. DOJ official on the details of this. Does, does everybody now understand why Trump has been saying for the last three years this is a witch hunt? Okay, I also understand why President Trump was so upset with former Senator and AG Jeff Sessions. Now, yes. I, I, yeah. When yes. I hear William Barr, he's expecting that is, that is Jeff Sessions. Uh, Donald Trump, President, he's expecting uh, William Barr, come on, Tim, you can do this. He's expecting Jeff Sessions to defend him in the way that William Barr, not defend him, but defend the truth. Yes, exactly. So that's, Stand up for what was right and note what was wrong. And when Jeff Sessions recused himself, he was... There was no one at the department got, gotcha, to, to, gotcha. to stand for the president. You're listening to today's issues on the American Family Radio Network. Well, I'm sure we'll have more tomorrow, even, uh, from these... Uh, Hearings today, but uh, they're being carried live. Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, I'll tell you, I've earned a new respect for that guy mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of years. He is really, especially during the Kavanaugh hearing. Yeah. Um, and so. But you know what? Barr, in some of the interviews he was giving yesterday, also made mention at least a couple of times the complicity of the media in this country working with the Democrats. Mm hmm. A real good journalist could easily find out the things that Barr is talking about, that Lindsey Graham has been talking about. Yeah. A really they good they journalist. They don't want to. They, they don't, don't want to. They don't yeah, want to. And, and really, if it wasn't for uh, Congressman Devin Nunes yes. and, and Mark, uh, Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, and a few others uh, exposing all of this, remember a year or two ago they started doing the, the Republican memo and things like that. Without a handful of these people and Sean Hannity and Mark Levin exposing all of this, we likely wouldn't know it nope. until John Durham has finished. Look, the bottom line here is it's clear that the uh, there were a lot of people in high places at the Justice Department and the uh, and the uh, FBI, and the FBI is in the same building, right? Or are they? Uh, I think I, uh, the DOJ. I think they might be at separate buildings. FBI is in a Hoover. The DOJ building. oversees the uh, exactly. FBI. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they did not want Donald Trump to become president. No. And they, and and then after he became president, they wanted to cut him off at the knees. Mm -hmm. Huh? That's clear. Yes. That's what was going on here, because of the reasons that Lindsey Graham's talking about and that Horowitz laid out. And you said a while ago, uh, a while ago, Walker, mm -hmm. the uh, they intentionally misled the FISA court judges by leaving information out that was critical before the judges granted, judge or judges granted them permission to spy on uh, the Trump campaign. Yes. And, so, and, that, and that's a big no-no when it comes to war search warrants. 
you include all the evidence, and if the evidence doesn't support your theory, then you don't do the search warrant. Right, but you have to tell the judges everything you know. That's right. So that they can consider all the facts in deciding whether you're going to be able to spy on a private American citizen, right? Yes. Surveil, they call it. Yeah. And uh, they didn't do that because they wanted to be able to spy on the Trump campaign, and so they didn't want the judge blocking them. There you go. <laughs> this is America. That's, what's, that's what Lindsey Graham's getting to yes. today. Yep. You're listening to the radio program, Today's Issues on the American Family Radio Network. That's just one element of this whole mess. Mm -hmm. And Robert Mueller, the former special counsel, spent two years yeah. and millions of dollars, we know this, trying to pin something on President Trump related to a Russia connection on the invest on the uh, campaign excuse me on the election you know how he colluded with them two years got a team of what 15 or 20 Clinton lawyers yeah M many of them donated to Clinton basically an unlimited budget and they couldn't nail him mm -hmm. because because there was no nothing to nail yeah no evidence no, no they're there yeah amazing amazing it's it, quite quite frankly it's been amazing that President Trump has been able to accomplish as much as he has and been able to do his job day to day with this kind of stuff going on. Uh, you know, this this would anger anybody. You think you've been duly elected by the yes. American people to be the president. You want to do great things for the country. Yeah, you're going to have the Democrats who are going to oppose you on policy. Yeah. But you get in and you discover, well, it's not only opposing the Democrats opposing me on policy, it's the resistance. In other words, they're they're going to vote. They're going to fight me against everything. Yes. And also the, the the resistance. And then it's also you find out that there are leakers everywhere who are deep state people who yes. are Obama Clinton people who yeah. want to destroy your presidency. So I mean, it's just been one thing after another that the president has had to contend with. So whether you like Donald Trump or not, and I know that's a big if. But whether you like him or not, uh, you, you have a, 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 an objective observer has to sit, has to say uh, he, the, he he had to go against a lot of people who were in powerful positions and who were already entrenched in the federal government who wanted wanted to destroy his presidency. Yes. Before it started and after he got started. Well, and it just goes, and I mentioned this a moment ago, you know, President Trump has been saying witch hunt, witch hunt. Right. That's exactly what it is. He's been talking about deep state. Yeah. Now, I think the American public are starting to see what he means by deep state. Mm -hmm. He had an establishment against him when he was running, when it started to look more and more like he might win this election. He might mm -hmm. actually win this election. Uh, they started to work against him full time. Yeah, it was amazing. I, I just been given an updated cut here from the uh, the uh, the hearing this, is this morning. Lindsey Graham. This is Lindsey Graham questioning Michael Horowitz about the motive behind it all. Let's have a listen. In January 2017, when they figure out the primary subsource and they talk to the to the Russian guy that provided steal all the information. What should the FBI have done at that moment? Two things. We considered internally where things stood and, most importantly, told the lawyers at the Justice Department who they were asking to help them get a FISA. Did they have a duty to report to their supervisors and eventually to the court exculpatory information? Absolutely. They did not? They did not. Why? That's the question um, I can't specifically answer for you. Can you say it wasn't because of political bias? On, on decisions regarding those FISA matters, I do not know okay. their state of mind at this point. Wait a minute. The whole, the whole news uh, headline a couple days ago was Michael, is it Michael? Michael, yeah, Michael, Michael Horowitz the, finds no political bias in Trump investigation. Now he's, what he's saying right there is he can't say there wasn't because <laughs> clearly there was. And that's what, that's what uh, Lindsey Graham is... You know what saying. seems to always happen with these reports? These Michael Horowitz reports. He does a lot of good uh, digging, gets, right. a, gets all the evidence together, 
And then I'll tell you what happens. He brings in the people included in the report. He brings in Andrew McCabe, James Comey. He even brings in William Barr, maybe even Jeff Sessions, and the rest of them. And they, they, they and their lawyers are allowed to review the report before it's released. And it always seems that Michael Horowitz conveniently includes one sentence that the media can use to fit their narrative. And that sentence this time is, we did not find any political bias that drove this investigation. Yeah. Because I don't know why else you would put that one key phrase in there. I wouldn't say anything. He should have just right. let that sentence out, just done the report, release the report, don't give an opinion on political bias, let everybody make their own uh, mind up based on the facts that are revealed. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so what's the next step here with this? Uh, will this go on all day today? And then the big, the big news is uh, going to be when um, the gentleman, uh, Durham. Durham, John Durham. The, uh, he is a former U.S. attorney, maybe a current U.S. attorney. He's a current U.S. attorney. Who's this? The, John uh, Durham. Durham. Yeah, he's he's a U.S. prosecutor in Connecticut, in right? Connecticut. Yeah, in Connecticut, and he's been unleashed <laughs> by William Barr. Yeah, to do far more than Horowitz is able to do. Can I mention one quick yeah, thing? Ahead. People may not be aware of Michael Horowitz is the Inspector General for the DOJ, Department of Justice. Yeah. Do you know how when he became? That in the, that position under Barack Obama in 2012. Right. He came into the Obama administration in 2012. He made a lot of friends in the DOJ in that time. Could that have influenced his report? Yeah. So we won't know. Yeah, never know. Uh, so you said he's not an outside independent. No. His not office really. was in, his office was in the same building with all these other names. Yeah. We, yeah. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Abraham Hamilton will be with us. Welcome back, everybody, to today's issues on the American Family Radio Network. We thank you for listening to AFR. Uh, we're live video streaming on YouTube and Facebook if you'd like to join us there. And, uh, again, we thank you for listening. Hope you're having a wonderful December, looking forward to Christmas Day as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and a uh, special time of year it is, and uh, so we hope that you've you got great plans. Tim Wildman here with Walker Wildman and Fred Jackson, and Abraham Hamilton III is with us in studio. Abe joins us most Wednesdays, uh, and Abe is general counsel for AFA, he's also public policy analyst, and a radio talk show host in the afternoon for us here on the Hamilton Corner from 5 to 6 o'clock. And he's got uh, five children. I do. A uh, lovely and talented wife. But uh, so other than that, Abe's got a lot of free time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. No, he does have to sleep from 11 to 6. But other than that, uh, he could probably squeeze in a couple minutes. <laughs> uh, good morning, Abe. Good morning. Uh, Y'all homeschool, true? We do. You've we been do. doing that with all your children? Yes, we've been doing it. My oldest is nine now, so we've been doing it. We started when he was two, so we've been doing it seven years now. Now, what's the what's the most challenging part of that? Uh, of I think the most challenging part is navigating the various learning styles. So we have children with, with different learning styles. And uh, communicating the information um, that's needed with the children uh, that magnifies and, and responds to their corresponding learning styles. I think that's Christian, one of the biggest challenges. Abe's oldest son, Christian, is brilliant. Nine? Yeah, I taught to you a year or two ago, and, and he was at like a reading level yeah. a couple of years at least above his, yeah, he's a, his yeah. current age. He's a pretty cool cat. Yeah. <laughs> He was challenging me to an algebra test the other day. Was he? Yeah, and I thought I was a little offended by that because I'm his elder. Yeah, you know what I'm, saying? I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I don't want to take. Uh, I don't want to take any nine-year-old who feels confident about an algebra test. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. So you got the nine-year-old, uh, and how do you? Uh, do they do their own homework? I know. I know a lot of homeschoolers, so I know the answers to a lot of these questions. But yeah. I'm always, always curious how you manage multiple children in a home. Yeah, doing, making sure they get their work done. Well, one one of the objectives is, is to cultivate with them such a hunger for learning that gotcha. they are self learners, and so uh, the older ones are at a place where we can pretty much give them their assignments, 
and they can handle them on their own. Really? That's great. Yeah, and and it's one of the things that I think sometimes gets overlooked that they actually love learning. I mean, when babies come out, they come hungry for knowledge. And, yeah. And we often don't realize that the, a disdain for learning sometimes comes from peers, but not from them, the children. They love learning. And, and I'm sure some of your older ones are, are going to get to a point, or probably already at a point, where they can teach some of the younger ones. So. Yeah, that's happening. Um, and actually... They, my oldest daughter is seven, my oldest son is nine. They, uh, we, we give them agency in that in helping the other ones learn not complex issues. Sure, but, but basic complex stuff. Subjects, but basic things. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're learning it, so it's, it's already happening. Okay, uh, Fred, you yes. wanted to ask our, yes. our attorney here on hand about what's the, you had some questions related to what we've been discussing earlier. Right? Yes, coming out of the uh, hearing this morning, the Senate Judiciary Committee, the chairman there is Lindsey Graham. One of the major points he made during his opening remarks had to do with the FBI lawyer who <laughs> oversaw and drew up the petitions to the FISA court. His last name is Klein Schmidt. Yes. His first name? I'm Kevin. Kevin. Kevin Klein Schmidt. So at some point in the process, he gets an email from the CIA with regards to Carter Page. Yes. Because you've probably heard out there in the media reports that Carter Page was working with the Trump campaign, was talking with three Russian agents. Well, it turns out he didn't talk to those, not at all. So, uh, and then the, the CIA lets Kleinschmidt know, oh, by the way, Carter Page has been working for us, the CIA, kind of spying for us. Mm -hmm. You should be aware of that, Mr. Kleinschmidt. Kleinschmidt gets this information. Yes. But he leaves that information out, the Carter Page. It's even worse than that. Is it? it yeah, it's even worse than that. So... Klein Smith was con what the CIA learned what the FBI was trying to do concerning Carter Page. Yes. The CIA contacted the FBI and said, whoa, 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 whoa. This Carter Page guy has been working for us specifically to thwart Russian spying. Yes. We think you have it all wrong. Klein Smith asks the CIA, can you give me that in writing with some documentation to support what you're saying? The CIA sends an email to Klein Smith laying out everything they've conveyed to him verbally. Klein Smith alters the FBI's email. He, he doesn't just or leave the it CIA's. out. I'm sorry, the CIA's email. He doesn't yeah. just leave it out. Wow. He edits the CIA's email to make the CIA's email to him say the exact opposite of what they told him. And then they use that be altered felony. email. That's called falsification of government communication. That'll be a felony. And, and it's classified. This is classified information. Use the falsified information to continue forward with the FISA application. It, it, wow. this, this, is, this is diabolical. This is diabolical. And, and Abe, Abe, I think our listeners, if they're anything like me, they've almost become numb to this corruption that went on under President Obama yes. and his, his surrogates. Um, but... You're, we're talking about innocent uh, American citizens. Carter Page, who actually was an ally of the U.S. government, worked for the CIA to protect our country from all, everything we know. And here we have the FBI ignoring that, falsifying evidence, and still going after him to, so that they can get a door. Uh, it's, it's an open door into the Trump campaign is what it was. And... <laughs> What many people are not aware of, that Kevin Kleinschmidt was a rabid anti-Trump individual. He hated President Trump. Hated President Trump. Considered Mike Pence to be, he said in his own text messages, one of the dumbest people ever to walk the earth. And this is the person. Talking about Mike Pence? Talking about Mike Pence, okay. yes. This is the person who is handpicked to work on the so, Strzok team. So, Abe, how, how, without laughing, can the Inspector General insert this one sentence <laughs> a few pages in to 500 pages that says we cannot, we absolutely cannot find any political bias? It's absurd. Frankly, it's absurd. And that's why the Attorney General William Barr... And John Durham have both come out saying, oh, we disagree with with 
the, the Inspector General's conclusions on some of these issues, and also highlight the fact, in John Durham specifically, this is why my investigation, which is a criminal investigation, is not limited to DOJ components, but we have the ability to uh, interview witnesses in the United States and beyond. Foreign. Foreign. Yeah. Well, this, this, is, this is why John Durham came out and made it the point to convey that. And even in the hearing this morning, I heard right before coming on the air, uh, Lindsey Graham was asking Michael Horowitz about this specifically, and Horowitz made sure he mentioned, and this is also why my report indicates that we referred these matters to the Attorney General's office for a criminal investigation, because yeah. we don't do criminal And the reason that's important, the powers that a U.S. prosecutor and the Attorney General have beyond the Inspector General, is that... There's this well-built uh, narrative. Uh, you could say it's well-built. I think it's pretty flimsy. But there's this narrative that's been built by the media, by the left, by James Comey and all of his allies, that this was done right, it was done proper, no political bias, you know, on and on and on. But that narrative is confined to the U.S. mainland yeah. because we've had corrupt people running these departments. Yes. And what, what John Durham is finding out is that there's people outside of the U.S., that are probably uh, talking a little more and telling people what actually is going on. I mean, you have a Time Magazine article that came out just last night <laughs> with, uh, I forgot how to pronounce his name. I have it on my desk. The one person who Gordon Sondland said uh, he spoke to that emphasized the quid pro quo, the guy came out, told the, the Times, no, that never happened. That conversation wow. never happened. And the Times published it last night. I'm going to talk about it on the air this evening. Wow. Yeah. Say, Whoa, so you had an entire impeachment inquiry and you completely leave that fact out? Nobody talked to this guy? And he was a key. He was supposed to be a key source. He is the, the key source. He's the, the, the Ukrainian president's number two. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but nobody talked mm, to him. Wow. You know, I, I think these, these this is a purely a opinion, uh, but that's what we do here sometimes, right? Uh, but opinion based on all the facts that's come forth here in the last six months in particular, uh, and that is that these people, by these people I mean the deep state folks and the, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, officials at the Department of Justice and the FBI and their underlings who were uh, politically driven, they saw themselves as the savior uh, as saving America from Donald Trump. Yeah, that's what that's what they. That's the reason that they. Uh, and, and really saving from the deplorables, because saving America. That's true. That's true. Trump. Saving. Yeah. Saving America from President Trump, from a presidency under Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and from us. That's right. Yeah. The deplorables. Yeah. Uh, and those who supported him. So that's the mission they were on, and it, it was really a ends justifies the means approach. Exactly. That we're seeing now come forth. So things were shaded, things were omitted, things were uh, uh, political motivations were 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 there, but they were justified because yep. we had to we had to get Hillary in this, and and had to keep. Yeah, them this follows a, a, a years long trend uh, under the Obama administration of completely disregarding any constitutional concepts, any kind of law that might prevent their agenda from taking place. And we saw this multiple times under Obama. And so from a purely non-law-abiding standpoint, this was a brilliant strategy. Weaponize the strongest, most powerful, and intrusive system in the world to go after the opposing campaign expecting Hillary Clinton to win. And if Hillary Clinton would have won, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. Today. No one would know about it. No. And, and, and there was a... There was a 70-30 chance in their minds, and among most political pundits, that she was going to win. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was a very long shot. Yep. It was a long shot for him. I mean, I mean, think about that. This happening in our government, and we would have no clue. No. No I know. clue, man. I know. James, James Comey and Andrew McCabe might still be at the FBI. They would be. Yeah. Mm. They will be rewarded for their loyalty. Yeah. Lisa Page, Peter Strzok. So what's going to happen from here politically, Abe? Do you think... Uh, uh, President Trump is, is going to, the Senate's not going to convict him. Uh, no. So he's not going to be convicted. Is that the right terminology here? Yeah. Uh, Move him. Yeah, uh, they, won't, yeah. they won't. So he'll be, yeah, convicted. he'll right. survive. 
and the, and the Senate will, and then this will be over, and then we'll then we'll move into the obviously the primary season yeah. for the Democrats, and then we look forward to the fall. So do you do you see any political fallout here? Well, well yeah. Well, just yesterday there was a Quinnipiac poll that that revealed that 51 percent of the American populace is opposed to impeachment. Mm-hmm. This came out just yesterday. 51 percent, and this is after. The entire impeachment inquiry that did not allow any uh, pro-Trump witnesses that that was completely right. in the tank uh, for impeachment. And following that, the majority of the American populace has moved to the place, according to Quinnipiac, to where they, there is an opposition to impeachment. And so this this is going to be very bad, in my opinion, for the Democrats. This is backfired on them. This is backfired tremendously on them because the biggest thing that I think is a revelation for the American people is just how low they will go Mm -hmm. in order to destroy their political opponents. Mm. And to know that you are willing to completely trample the Constitution for that to be out in public for all the regular people to see. Mm -hmm. There's one thing for us talking on the radio to know that, but for the American people to see, wait a minute, you are willing to attempt to impeach the president with an article of impeachment called obstruction of Congress? Which is never, that's no, there's no such thing. What is that? Right. Well, as I noted yesterday, I, I, that sounds like something I'm in favor of. <laughs> um, obstruction of Congress, I think it's probably... I mean, good. think about Congress's approval ratings, and you have right. somebody yeah. being charged... Somebody obstructing them, please. Well, and we talked, Abe, yesterday about how, you know, this thing called Fast and Furious under Obama, and how he would not turn over any documents. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's obstruction of he Congress. He used executive privilege. Nine presidents have yeah. had cases brought to the Supreme Court concerning the separation of powers, where the Supreme Court has consistently held, including under Barack Obama and under Bill Clinton, that Congress does not have jurisdiction over the president. Could Carter Page, the uh, guy who was spied upon for the Trump campaign, could he not sue uh, the uh, FBI? Depending on the things that he's experienced following this, and if he can make an appropriate damage claim, he very well may be able to file a lawsuit. He would have to show that this was a gross deviation yes. from the norm. Um, so it well, he was spied on. Yes. He was spied on by the United States government, the FBI, and he was spied on. And the re, uh, the uh, the uh, judge that granted him granted the FBI. The surveillance rights, or the, the warrant, yeah. the warrant uh, was misled. Lied to. So I, I'm just and saying. So the FBI is going to say, oh, this is just a mistake. That's why uh, Horowitz is trying to say, oh, this is, it's not the best practices. Uh, <laughs> but but this is not the type of. We're dealing you know, with the most, right. the most uh, power, like I said, the most powerful and sensitive process hey. in the judicial system. Let's move on. And, and and we make 17 mistakes. Let's move on, uh, although we could spend a lot more time on this. It's clear what's happened here. And congratulations to Lindsey Graham for doing a great job on this committee. And we'll be learning more throughout the afternoon of some of these things that he finds out. Uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, Naval Air Station shooting. Yes. In uh, Pensacola. Believe it or what not. We know, what's the latest on that? Well, the Washington Post reporting this morning, they've been doing some investigation into that uh, Saudi Arabian pilot trainee at Pensacola who carried out that shooting last week. Three other cadets, American cadets, died. Well, there's, they're investigating. Was he uh, radicalized? When was he radicalized in believing into terrorism? Well, the Washington Post is reporting this morning that apparently he was radicalized, and what we mean by that is He's all in on terrorist activity. He's a jihadi. Yeah. 2015. <laughs> He's they, been in the military for four years since then? He was come radicalized on, in 2015. He didn't come to the United States until 2017. So what? two years before he arrives in the United States, he's promoting terrorism against Israel and the United States. <laughs> He arrives 2017 in the United States, becomes a trainee at the Pensacola Air Station. Now what's being talked about this morning, by golly gee, the Pentagon says, we better do a better job of vetting. So the Washington Post, no conservative news outlet, is able to find this out within days after this shooting. But the Pentagon, with all its resources 
is not able to vet and find out that they've got people now on an American base, military base, who hates America, who hates Israel. I, I have a question. <laughs> I mean, yes. I, I couldn't ask very simple questions at times. How was this man allowed into our country if there's evidence that he had jihadist leanings for two years prior to coming to our country? Because somebody didn't do their job at the uh, uh, at the uh, in the, at the Pentagon, am I right? Well, th that has to be. But but I take you back to Fort Hood. What nine years ago now? Major Hassan workplace violence. Workplace violence. Yeah, Major Hassan. The investigators showed after he killed what thirteen people, injured twenty people, others at Fort Hood. We we found out after an investigation that the military knew that he had pro-terrorist leanings long before the incident at Fort Hood and did nothing. Yeah. Well, that's nothing political, about that what, the reason, to answer your question, Abe, this political correctness, you know this, uh, it, which blinds people from objectivity. And so uh, I think in the case of, I remember hearing about the case of Hassan. Yes. Was, there were signs all along the way, but should anybody have done something to kick him out of the military, for example, they would have been accused of being uh, anti-Muslim. An Islamophobe. Yes. And so <laughs> that's what happened. And probably what happened here with this guy, this uh, jihadi that, you know, down on the Pensacola Naval Air Base, still amazes me that we're bringing people to our country to train them how to fly our jets. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me like if we're going to do anything like they go over there. Well, it's quit, it's quid pro quo because... <laughs> <laughs> the Saudis are buying hundreds of millions of dollars of airplanes, F-16s, and others from us. Yeah. And so the Pentagon says, gee whiz, you know, they're spending a lot of money. All I've got to say is, Saudi better stay our friend. Yeah, well, the Saudis. Because if not, we're, we're training a massive military that could easily turn. This, we're talking this, hundreds. This, this, yeah. this, I had Brigitte Gabriel on, on the Hamilton Corner a couple weeks ago. Just, just think about this guy. Think about where we are as a nation. From September 11th, 2001, the, the most severe terrorist attack, attack on American soil in American history, to where we have regressed, hence my re reference to regressive, regressed to the place to where our government has been infantilized, to where we cannot even inquire as to whether or not a person from a Muslim-majority nation is actually a terrorist. Yeah. Well, because you're a Islamophobe if you do that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I know. That <laughs> is insane. Yeah. <laughs> We've got, we have reduced our ability to right. stop terrorist attacks in our nation right. following the greatest terrorist attack our nation has ever suffered. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All in the name of progressivism? Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is utter rank foolishness. Yeah. That's made our country less safe. That we, There's blood on our government's hands. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and... Yes. You're right. You, with respect to this, you're talking about yes. what happened down there in Pensacola. Uh, what does radicalized mean when you hear that phrase? Well, he is now a believer <laughs> in terrorism. Which is not uh, radical according becomes, to the Quran. Yeah. He becomes a believer. He becomes a believer in, I must kill people right. who would oppose what I believe in. I must murder them. Mm. I have a just, I am justified in going out and committing mass murder. I, I, it, it boggles my mind that our society has been neutered from the ability to openly question whether or not a person's theological leanings give credence to their willingness to kill people. Right. When there is history, recent and ancient, that indicates a consistency, a continuity in thought. It right. doesn't mean that every single yeah. person who professes to be a Muslim is automatically a murdering terrorist. No. Yeah. And th this, this no. goes into no. President Trump wanting to vet people coming into our country. But I vet people coming into my house. Oh, right. right. But, him, but him being starkly uh, rejected and hand-tied by the, by the court system and the left uh, trying to vet people coming into our country. All right. I want to talk to Abe about this in the last few minutes we got left here. Uh, the Democratic candidates that are still that still remain, uh, there's about what eight 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 of them. No, uh, at which, least which ones do you think are viable? Now, by viable, I mean viable to win the Democratic Not nomination, me. 
and they, which one, and I know this is a snapshot in time, you know, next week there may be something come up that makes this, this uh, answer to this question in your mind different, but who would you say is uh, the, maybe the three most viable to win the nomination at this point, and which one would uh, be the be the closest challenger to President Trump? Yeah, I think the top tier of the Democratic candidates are Biden, Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren, who's receding some, uh, and Buttigieg is ascending a bit. But I, I think this may just be a temporary thing. But they are certainly the top four as it stands currently. And as crazy as it may be, their, their best shot still is Joe Biden, really, uh, to make any type of appeal beyond uh, the, the extreme regressive wing of the Democrat Party. Um, in order to have any type of appeal to, they don't. Anybody. They don't have anybody on their bench. No, huh? they, they don't. They they don't. Uh, frankly, no. they don't. And this is why I've long maintained, and I continue to argue that the entire impeachment thing really is an electoral strategy. It has nothing to do yeah. with justice. It has nothing to do with presidential accountability. It's all they got yeah. in order to try to damage President Trump as much as possible and, going into twenty. And the narrative, to Abe's point, is I saw a Democrat say this the other day. They're already saying this. If Trump is not removed from office, we will not have a free and fair election in 2020. And that is That's their, their narrative. That is their campaign narrative. Yes. Because they're already asserting that Trump has been so da- damaged and carries such a tinge mm-hmm. of negativity that, well, if he's elected, it's because the whole system is, is rigged. Yeah. Okay. So you got, uh, you still got Biden, and, uh, and then you got uh, Sanders, and you got Warren. Yep. So, and Mayor Pete's yeah. hanging out there on the floor. And hey. then there was a poll, what, in the last few days? Hillary Clinton? Yeah, I saw Beating that. them all? I saw that. Oh, please, Hillary, run. <laughs> please. Hey, I wanted to, sh- uh, if you're watching on Facebook, we're about to show you, or YouTube, we're about to show you two potential candidates in, <laughs> in 2040. Uh, and these are Walker's twins. I have one of them. Tell, tell her to bring in. The other one, number two. Uh, last time we did this, we saw a real spike in our viewership <laughs> on Facebook. Yeah, you check out our today's issues Facebook feed. The so Walker and Lexi had twins eight you, months ago. Eight months ago. So uh, we've decided to bring them into. You know, s- this is the quietest I've heard Samuel in a long time. <laughs> so go on to get the other. One. So today, well, they need to see them together, I guess. So they, <laughs> go on to today's issues Facebook or YouTube right now, and we're live, and we have. Walker's twins. Walker, you want to yeah, we got, we're, tell we got, who we're looking at? We have Samuel on the left. My dad's holding Samuel. Then you got the big five. Yeah, he's a he's a he's an offensive guard <laughs> or our tackle either one. Uh, he and then first, I think. Yeah, we have our our <laughs> wide receiver here, <laughs> skinny legs, Andrew. Uh, Samuel and Andrew, eight months now. Eight months. All right. Wow. And. Uh, you can credit me for forgetting their socks today. <laughs> Mom put me in charge of the socks. And you forgot their socks. It's only, it's only uh, 32 degrees That's out there. Right. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, I'll Just a little bit of ice on the ground. <laughs> I, I don't want to know if I want to be there when you tell her. You I, I already told her. Okay, okay. Best to break the news early. Okay. <laughs> All right, Samuel and Andrew Wildman, ladies and gentlemen. They may be running for uh, office in a few years. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Abe. Thank you. All right, Steve Jordahl. He's on AFR with your host, Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to today's issues on American Family Radio. Thank you for listening to AFR. Hey, before we get back to the news of the day, I wanted to remind you that uh, we have our uh, Spiritual Heritage Tour dates set for 2020. And we have tours of Washington, D.C. and Mount Vernon. And then we have uh, uh, Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown. Stephen McDowell, who's the president of the Providence Foundation, is a historian and noted author own history, and he will be with us. He'll be going everywhere with us to give talks, to answer questions, to put in context the people, the places, the times, and events, and also include our Christian heritage. So, uh, we have a lot of fun and eat good, too. Mm. So, we're going in 2020 in 
June and September, as we always do, June and September, best weather months for the mid-Atlantic there, where we'll be. So if you want to go with us, uh, we're already halfway full for June, but uh, if you want to check out the dates and the prices and the itinerary and all that good information, if you want a vacation with a purpose, so to speak, go to the website spiritualheritagetours.com for all the information, spiritualheritagetours.com. And my wife, Alice, and I will be hosting those tours. So we'd love to spend some time with you. Uh, Steve, good morning. Good Start off. morning, everybody. It's been quite a, quite an interesting morning. Yeah, what have you been doing all morning, Steve? Oh, nothing much. I've been <laughs> monitoring, uh, monitoring uh, hearings on Capitol Hill. I've been putting sound clips together for us. I've been doing, yeah, it's been busy. All right, what, what's leading the news? Well, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about some of the things surrounding, but not directly involved with this uh, impeachment hearing. Do you know, do you remember what the Democrats are charging uh, uh, the president with doing, with withholding money for political purposes from, yes. from the, Ukraine? The uh, Latin expression is quid pro quo. Yes, uh-huh. uh, well, um, my good friend and colleague, a former colleague, Indiana Congressman Jim Banks, has an interesting theory. I'd like you to listen to what he has to say. I think uh, this will be self-explanatory. Cut nine. Speaker Pelosi at a press conference this morning admitted that she has held the USMCA hostage for an entire year for political reasons to time the USMCA vote with the impeachment vote that's going to happen here in just days. Now, let me tell you, my constituents in Indiana have been begging for USMCA since the president negotiated it with Canada and Mexico. And the fact that Speaker Pelosi admitted that she played politics with the timing of the USMCA coming to the, coming to the floor for a vote is an absolute shame, and she should be held accountable for that. Speaker Pelosi has played politics not just with the impeachment sham, but with, uh, with withholding the USMCA, a better trade deal for American workers as well. She is guilty of withholding funds from the American people for political reasons. Imagine that little tongue-in-cheek there. Mm-hmm. But, but seriously, you know, the, the, this USMBC, USMCA has been agreed upon by the three countries, Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., for months now. And it's just been sitting in the House of Representatives not having a vote scheduled. Now, thankfully, it's going to have a vote. But, you know, the USMCA is... Is that like the new NAFTA? Exactly. It's a trade agreement between the three countries. Yeah. And uh, it's it's going to, from what I hear, from a economical economic standpoint, it's going to be very good. Uh, it, it benefits the U.S. a little more uh, from an incentive standpoint than the NAFTA, than the former trade agreement called NAFTA. And like it or not, this is what President Trump campaigned on, and he actually has been talking about how bad NAFTA is for over a decade now. Even when he was a businessman, he did interviews talking about how bad NAFTA is. So if, if, if we can get this through, talking about Congress, and the president signs it, that is a huge victory in general for the country. It is, and it's interesting that they chose to announce it. It, it just mere minutes after Nancy Pelosi stood at the podium saying, we are somber and charging this president with high crimes and misdemeanors. Mere yeah. minutes later, she said, we have a, 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 <laughs> a victory to announce. We have. Well, you know, surprisingly, history shows that uh, legislative activity actually spikes during impeachment. For the few impeachment that our country has had with really? Clinton and Nixon and now Trump and... and I think there was one other. Johnson? Johnson. Um, uh, yeah, legislative activity spiked, and I think it's because the parties, uh, the, the impeachment party wants to be viewed as still doing the people's work while they're also impeaching the president. Yeah. Well, ironic as it is. Yeah, so um, I think that the theory out there is that the Democrats held this announcement on USMC and, and, and doing this so that they could kind of cover up this sham of a of an impeachment that they know they sense is is going downhill, and I mean it took a huge downhill turn this morning with uh, with Inspector General Horowitz sitting in front of the Senate. Now uh, Democrats are trying to rehabilitate him, but Lindsey Graham, as you guys have already heard, was just devastating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, this, the Democrats I think are, are starting to rue the day 
You the, know, uh, I, I just looking at these senators. I'm just wondering. Uh, Twenty years from now, are we still gonna have Diane Feinstein on the committee asking? <laughs> huh? Well, they seem to be, uh, you know, set uh, in Patrick amber. Leahy. Yeah, Patrick Leahy's 131. I think he is. It, huh? He's closer to 132. <laughs> I mean, I'm seeing the same yeah. people. I'm seeing the same people I saw from the Clarence Thomas yeah. hearings, you know, back you in know, the day. You know, I think that's symbolic, to a certain extent, of what's uh, wrong with Washington. Yeah. Or it's telling, if you will, because I don't think our founding fathers intended for career, career politicians to be there 30 and 40 years. You know, I agree. Back during the founding days, uh, it was you had farmers, you had businessmen, who were. Uh, serving in our government, and they served for a handful of years and then did yeah. other things. I think our country would be much healthier with term limits. There's uh, a debate that goes back and forth. Well, let me, let me tell you why. Now, uh, that's never going to happen. I say never. I don't, not in my lifetime. I agree. Term limits, term limits while they would be uh, good on balance for our country, are not going to happen. So I'm really talking about a theory here. I realize that um, because people will tell me, well, you do have term limits. It's called elections to be voted out. Uh, that's true, but that's not factoring in the real advantages that incumbents have in terms of the incumbents in a federal government can use. I'm going to get Christmas cards from all the sitting uh, representatives of my in, in, right. And guess, guess who those Christmas cards are going to be paid for? By me. Right. From, 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 and that's fine. I, I, I like getting those. I'm just saying that that's a, a goodwill gesture that, that may help build the uh, uh, support base for whoever that candidate is or that uh, politician is. Yeah. So, now, so, but I, I do think you, I, I do think experience counts for something and shouldn't be just dismissed. So I don't think we need quick turnover necessarily in our federal government, in Congress and Senate, in the Senate, in the House and in the Senate. But if you had something, uh, there's a reason we, there's a reason the President of the United States only has two terms. Yeah. Okay. I think that same reason should apply to Congress so that uh, if whatever the term limit is that you want to put on Congressman, Let's say a House of Representatives member, you want to say, can serve five terms. Mm. That's that, 10 years. That's 10 years. And you want to say a United States senator can serve two terms. That would be 12 years. 12 years, yeah. 12 years. Okay, I think that's, why is that not enough? The flip side of that, I think, is if you recall uh, back in the 1700s, 1800s, William Wilberforce fought for 50 years in the English House English uh, Parliament to uh, before he was able to get the traction needed to do away with slavery. So things take a long time. Yeah, and, and I, that's a that's a maybe well, a there's, one off. There's there's pros. Well, there's really pros to both, uh, but I think the cons outweigh <clears throat> the the negative effects of no term limits outweigh the possible positive effects that that you're talking about. Yeah, because yeah. what happens what happens in, in any institution is if you know you if you know you're pretty much there forever, well, you're not accountable anymore. Yeah, you're really not, and um, and your motivation for doing things, uh, yeah. huh? Yeah, and and one of the one of the I would say one of the major problems are uh, some might not call it a problem, but. You know, the longer you're in Congress or in the Senate, the higher you advance when it comes to committees. Right. And when you start running a committee that handles the money, and your state is getting millions, sometimes billions. That's how it works, though. In, yeah. That's in, the problem. In, uh, in federal government subsidies and grants, etc., then you have a stranglehold on yeah. that state uh, when it comes to money. Maybe one day we will see term limits. I don't think it'll be in my lifetime, but uh, ter by term limits uh, on, uh, on House of Representative members and on Senate members, I think something, what, you could say the 15 years, mm -hmm. 20 years, whatever you want to say, but there's a principle that's not, uh, that, that we have that, uh, think about, 
a church committee. Right. We have, well, people rotate off, don't they? Yeah, in most, yeah. Most, they, they rotate, they're not there. Most every club I know, you have board members. Well, the board members rotate, they serve their term, and then they rotate off. Why do you do that? What's the principle behind that? Is to keep somebody from building up the, a power base. And it's also to, uh, you know, to hold them uh, more, more accountable. accountable. Right. So it's the same principle that's not applied to Congress. There is no, you know, term limit of how long they can serve. Yeah. And I think there should be, but there won't be. So I don't know why I spent five minutes on it. <laughs> no, it's... But but we, but 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 you know, President uh, was it President uh, Roosevelt? Six terms. Franklin Delano De- yeah. Roosevelt. Uh, four, four terms. And after wow. that, after that, our country decided that's not good. We don't yeah. need we don't need so much. Well, the the argument would have been if oh uh, well, we have a term limit. He, either the American people elect him or they don't. Well, the Congress decided. I guess yeah. was the Congress. Is it, it is a constitutional amendment. Yes, it the term, is. Term, yeah, term right. limits is mentioned two, for the two, president. Two I mean, terms for the president. Yes. The, uh, the American, we decided as a country, eight years is enough for one man yeah. to be in power. So, Indeed. all right, uh, next up, Fred. I mean, uh, Steve. You can call me Fred. It's an honor. You can call, you can call me Tom. It doesn't bother me. Uh, a bunch of pastors. Don't call me late for dinner. All right. A bunch of pastors and worship leaders went to the Oval Office last week as President Trump was getting into the meat of this impeachment. They were getting into it on uh, against him. And these prominent uh, Christian pastors and worship leaders prayed over the president in the Oval Office uh, for about an hour. Mm. Fifty worship leaders from across America uh, went. Uh, <laughs> said all 50 of them crammed into the Oval Office, one of them said. And uh, they prayed for the president as he was, uh, as he was getting ready to do this. I got to tell you, Mr. Trump seems built for this. I don't know of anybody else that... Did you guys talk about his uh, his campaign stop? Uh, in, no, we have not covered that yet. Let me just play you a little bit of this. Um, I wanted to, want you to hear a little bit of um, what, how President Trump was handling the crowd in Pennsylvania last night. This is cut 11. He's talking about... Well, this is... Let's just listen to how up he sounds. We are so hot. We are so hot. And just a few weeks ago, the United States Special Forces brought the world's number one terrorist to justice. Thanks to the strength and courage of our warriors, and they are great warriors. The bloodthirsty savage known as al-Baghdadi is now dead. And he was quickly replaced by his second in command. And his second in command is now dead. (laughs) He's just taking a victory tour. Where was the president speaking? In Pennsylvania. Last night? Yeah, last night in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was was in rare form. let me uh, just play a little bit. What's one rare the, form for Donald Trump? Well, <laughs> this this whole he seems battle, a little more bra- a little ener- more energetic. Energetic, and he's already an energe- energetic guy. He really is. Uh, but this this I think just gave him a little bit more of a push. I'm trying to find the one that Fred had. You remember what number that was, Brent? No, that's uh, no. This is um, we can do that one. Um, Let's do that one. Let's do 10. This is him. This is uh, something that he's done. I heard him do this when he came and visited Tupelo. Peter Strzok and his lover, Lisa Page. Remember? Lisa, I love you so much. Lisa, please, Lisa, please. Lisa, I've never loved anyone like you. We won't allow this to happen to our country. Peter, I love you. And if for any reason... If for any reason she loses, even though she's a stone-cold, corrupt person, if for any reason she loses, Peter, we've got to have an insurance policy. We have to do it. <laughs> there you have it. He, he just, he just. I gotta tell you, as up. a, as a uh, sarcastic mocker. He's one of the best. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's good at it. And he, 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 he he's, he's very listenable. 
He's Go good ahead. with uh, coming up with names. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but he's he's describing the text, which is tr- true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> between the, uh, the FBI agents who were out to save the country yeah. from Donald Trump. And so you can see why he would mock because uh, it's it's just it's like he's a major league hitter and somebody put about about ball on a tee yeah for him when he gets in that environment uh, uh, it's true it's, yeah it's, it's, he thrives it's, yeah all right you're listening to today's issues on the American Family Radio Network next story a federal judge has blocked the use of billions of dollars that the Pentagon was going to contribute towards building a border wall. Mm-hmm. This is Judge David Briones of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas. And he said, what did he, say? he says that you cannot use the money, uh, that the, the money can't be put over from the, uh, the, the um, Department, of Defense. Department of Defense. He said the president's emergency plot, uh, well, this is actually um, his, the lawyers on the other side said that. Uh, President's emergency pro- proclamation was a blatant attempt to grab power from Congress. Today's order affirms that the president is not a king and that our courts are willing to check him when he oversteps his bounds. This was the Council for Protect Democracy, one of the groups that was bringing the lawsuit to try to stop this. Okay, so that will be appealed by the Trump administration on up to the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, that's it probably that'll, that's will. where that will go. Yeah. Okay, what else you got? Um... The uh, Media Research Center is suing, is filed a complaint with the Federal Elections Commission against Bloomberg News. Bloomberg News, you may remember, said, we are not going to do any investigations of our founder, Michael Bloomberg, nor are we going to do any investigations of his Democratic uh, opponents. We are going to continue to just nail and hammer on President Donald Trump. Well... MRC, maybe Research Center, thought, you know, that's a campaign contribution. An illegal one at that. I want you to hear what uh, uh, one of their spokespersons, that, whose name I will bring up when I hear his voice, <laughs> uh, what he had to say. The actual laws actually say that if facility is owned or controlled by any political party, political committee, or candidate, and fails to give reasonably equal coverage to all opposing candidates. I mean, that is that is the way um, the FEC law is written. So, I mean, in this case, you have a media organization that is owned by one of the candidates, and it's explicitly said that they are not going to be giving fair coverage. So, I mean, it seems like it meets the definition to a T. That's Scott Whitlock. Uh, from Media Research Center. Well, tell me what news agency does give uh, fair treatment to President Trump. I asked him that, and it's a fair point. Um, It is. What makes this a little bit different is that that Bloomberg has officially announced on the record that they will not cover any or investigate, do any investigative journalism on any Democrat candidate Oh, but not not just Bloomberg. Not just Bloomberg, and they will continue to investigate Donald J. Trump. That's their official mm-hmm. policy right. on the record. Is so, that illegal, though? If I you, don't know. If you own, so the Media Research Center, they're our friends, by the way, Brent yep. Bozell and that, mm-hmm. that group. Uh, if you own a news agency like Michael Bloomberg does, he's a CEO, right? He is. He's the owner. I mean, yeah. he's the top dog. Yeah. And he owns it. Um, <laughs> the real world is you really think they're going to be investigating him anyway? I kind of get that but the fact yeah. that they said that they weren't even going to look into his Democrat opponents they have announced. Well now that is different That that's you, a step beyond. You really though, you really can't have it it either has to be all or nothing you either need to just say we're going to continue to investigate whoever or whatever or we're staying out of the 2020 election which we, we know they're not going to do Right because it's ratings, it's readership. Yeah, uh, anyway, you know, the, the Dem- we know it's baked in with the American public. I think most people understand this. The mainstream news media. This looks like maybe the half-tailed possum's home. Up in here. Got this. Kind of hard to make out. 
There's the toes. One toe, two toe, three toe, four toe. And uh, here's the heel. So that's like two and a half, two and a quarter inches, one and a quarter inches, three quarters of an inch. Kind of a long paw mark. That's kind of what a possum's got. Nothing else, no other footprints inside. Not good. It's one of my big oaks. So apparently it's ratted out in the center. 